you're never prepared, you know. You're just never prepared. The sad thing about it, you don't even have time to think about it, what's happened. Because suddenly they're taking your loved one off to the funeral home and you're their car funeral home was on the phone to me before I could even get my senses saying, come out here right now and make arrangements. You know? And I told the lady, I said, I'm so sorry, but my mother just passed away. And they start asking me a million questions. And I stand right there in the hospice residence. And I lost my temper. I said, well, can we, can we discuss this when I get there? You know? <laughs> and she said, oh, oh, oh yes, we sure can. You know, in that funeral director voice. She's said, uh, does she have pre arrangements? Does she have prepayment? Does she have this? Does she have that? Does she have that? that? I said, can we discuss this when I get there? And so I didn't have time, you know, I said, off to the funeral home. Then they lay on me, you know what? Well, now, we'll accept, uh, we'll accept assignment on her life insurance for, the, for the, all the other expenses, but the cost of opening and closing the grave, the actual burial expense, we have to have paid in advance, and that'll be $1,800. And I had to go round up $1,800 from somewhere. And boy, that took a little bit of uh, creative uh, financing. And you know, if you had somebody to share it with, you see, I was all, all alone. You know, I had nobody to, you know, share that uh, responsibility. And uh, I was just out on my own. It is or what happened. It, I, there must have been a bad storm overnight. I didn't hear it. I was sleeping so soundly. My electricity's off. I can't see anything. I hear chainsaws going everywhere. I pissed my pants because I couldn't find my way to the bathroom. The floor in here is wet as water. I don't know if that's rainwater or piss. I don't know what's happened or what's going on. I can't get any. The only person I've been able to get is, is, is uh, Eddie, and he would need to talk to me. He was, he was busy with limbs with a chainsaw, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, talk to me for a minute, and he was gone. And, and the hell, I've called Eddie F and told him the electricity's off. I don't know what the hell is going on in this place. All I know is I'm, I, I've pissed my pants floor and everything else. I'm sitting here in the pitch dark. It's not pitch dark. It's daylight outside. Hell, but I don't know what. I don't have a clue what time it is. Nor do I have the slightest clue what happened overnight. What a mess. Call me if you get a chance. Please. I take care. Bye. No I mean, cell phone, phone, no phone, no house phone. This guy got in the very top, we're talking very top of about a hundred foot trail park. He took limbs down right onto the pavement. I mean, dropped them down, no accident, nobody got injured, nobody got hurt, the tree came down, and that's all we wanted. Well, I told Chuck, I said, look at you, man, look at you. I said, look, look at yourself. I said, look, amazing. The food that you drop and water you spill, that's nothing. We're going to get him out off alcohol, which I already did. Next is the cigarettes, but it's going to be slow. Because Chuck said, I'm not going to give up both of them. One, one, one vice at a time. But in there, but that Miss Lisa, though, whoo, she's on my case. I mean, she likes you. Mr. Cox, you live over there. You're his buddy. Now, he depends on you. Now, you're going to have to take care of it. But I said, well, I'll do it. If you call Adult Protective Services, she gave me the telephone number and explain your situation. If they take your case and they request us, then we essentially work for them under contract and then you would get first priority and there would be no waiting list. So I called I called the number immediately and spoke to the greatest guy in the world and he came out the very next morning at eight o'clock in the morning. When he saw my situation here, he said, well, uh, we're gonna take your case. And he said, uh, you, you won't be hearing about any waiting list. And so he got me on meals and we on wheels the next day. What is that? No, they don't bring a hot meal. All frozen.
I was a little bit of a disappointment. But the point is, all help is gratefully appreciated. Do you know what I mean? And then he got me on adult homemaking, so now I have a, 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 a wonderful lady named Cheryl who comes every Tuesday afternoon and cleans the apartment stem to stern, vacuums all the floors, mops all the floors, makes the bed, you know, you name it. How'd you, did, you get your, did you go get your eye checked or is that coming up? Uh, well, I, I, I don't do anything until uh, I actually go in for the surgery on the 13th. Okay, okay, that's good. I had my preoperative uh, screening at Vanderbilt. Will that, help you, will that help you at all in your eyes? Well, you know, we hope so. Uh, they're not making any promises at all. As a matter of fact, Eddie Gray will have an eye appointment with my surgeon at General today. He brought it up. I was going down to the East Nashville Library to check out 10 DVDs, because that was what I did about once or twice a week. My shirt was stuck, stuck to my skin. It was I was just incredibly hot. And I recall walking up the steps into the library, uh, looking forward to the air conditioning in the library, and opening the door, and it just seemed that something came over my eyesight. Oh, um, yeah. It was sudden. It was instantaneous. I couldn't imagine what had happened, and I thought, well, it's just a trick of the light going from outside to inside, or it's the heat. I sort of found my way to the shelves with the DVDs and then realized that I couldn't read the labels on any of them. And uh, bear in mind, I had just, the day before, finished reading a 640-page novel by James Elroy, which I shall always regret that... Uh, Unless some miracle happens, I'm sure I won't be able to read again. And, uh, I mean, no doctor is promising that result, that I will have my, my vision restored to that uh, extent. Uh, so I, I really shall always regret that that was the last thing probably that I ever read because uh, it, was, uh, it was an adequate thriller, but uh, I can't say much more for it than that. It was called Blood's a Rover, James Elroy. Actually, it was one of those uh, books where the epigraph to the novel is probably the best thing in the, in the entire book. And it's from a poem by A.E. Hausman, from I'm sure Hausman's A Shropshire Lad. And so I went into a temporary panic and then I thought, well, it's just the heat. And I didn't attempt to check anything out because I didn't know what they were. And I found my way out of there. Well, my vision was still clear enough to walk I walked home and I thought, well, as soon as I get cool, cool down, I'll be all right. But of course that wasn't the case. I couldn't imagine what had happened, but I still had enough vision to see to get around and um, even to be able to, to read a little bit. And so I thought, well, whatever that has happened, it will clear itself up. But over time then, uh, it began to degrade, deteriorate uh, slowly. I would notice from month to month a further diminution of my vision until finally I went to the doctor and, and to my amazement he diagnosed me with a bilateral retinal detachment. And uh, then of course uh, the friend who took me to the doctor asked the doctor what causes this to which he replied it just happens. I got, I got him some winter socks for him. I said, here, this is some winter socks for you. I got some more towel, brand new socks. She, I told Chuck, I said, you wouldn't get socks up here, buddy. These are winter socks. I gave Eddie my DVD player and TV set because I know I, I knew I would have no further use of them. That was when he was his cable was out for like eight days after that tornado he talks about. And I said, well, at least, uh, and now my, my TV did not have a converter box on it, so you couldn't get TV reception, but at least he can watch movies in it. Which, by the way, I can relate to totally. Bless his heart, he walked down to the store and got me batteries for my radio, and he installed the batteries and, and switched it out. So I had my radio to listen to, thanks to him. 
solid. But he had nothing going. 404, time for a nine. Yes, it is. 404 p.m. It took them eight days to get his cable back on. A woman follows you around, you don't get nothing done. Don't argue with them. Don't talk women. I mean, talk with her, let her get a bunch of women to her house, let them sound like a bunch of uh, wild geese or a bunch of chickens and start talking to me a mile an hour. I'm, a, I'm watching TV. And so when I'm watching TV, I kind of uh, clear them out. I don't see or hear nothing. But I can hear them a hollering and carrying on, but uh, I like to watch TV. Okay, I'm done with the eye drops then. You are? Yeah. You done with them? Not going to do no more. I said once this was well, empty. Have you checked with the doctor about your? Well, you I know. checked with her, but she never returned my message. Well, uh, we need mate. We need, no, they're gone for today now. Uh, well, I've got eye drops. You need them. Nah, these are just a particular prescription drop. I think I've got. I got some of them. I'll just let them go. I got some of that over there. I'll let them go. So I'm not gonna do no more because Doctor Thing will have more for me. Oh, after this surgery. Well, I think we're going to take you to a horse race, put you on a horse, you'll be the jockey, and you'll be, uh, <laughs> old Chuck really be going around the racetrack. <clears throat> so I'll go to Dr. Recky, and if I live through the surgery, then he'll have, he'll be prescribed. If uh, you're going to live through the surgery, surgery, they're going to knock you out. You ain't going to know where you're at. They, I tell you what, once uh, Doc Singleton says, uh, Chuck, Mr. Guy, <clears throat> count back in five. You'll never know what hit you. And I mean, you are out of it. I mean, when you wake up, you're in the recovery room. And they say, well, how you feel? Uh, now, I'm sure when you come out of there, you're going to be able to see out of both eyes. Well, they're just going to operate on one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a miracle. They're having to try to hold him together with glue and, and rubber bands. But he always says age is nothing but a number. If you don't come out there look good, I don't care if you don't come out there with a, you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to walk when you come out there, next day take a patch off, and she old Chuck ain't going to know what to think. He's just, Lord, I look around and see everything now. Well, I hope so, Eddie. Oh, yeah. I all sure you, hope so. All you better, too. I'd settle for just what Dr. Recchi has said his hope was, and that was that I could well, retain my... Well, you know what Dr. Singleton told me? Mm-mm. Mr. Cox... I did what? Now we're going in the operating room, and I think you're going to come out with a smile on your face. I said, thank you very much, and I sure did. Didn't take that patch off that day. The next day I took it off, and it was real dark at first, real dark. And boy, I took a patch off the next day, and, I, and man, I opened my eye, and I could just see. I looked around, and I mean, things were just as bright. Well, that's wonderful, lady. Because wonderful. I went in there with a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, also, you had cataract surgery. You didn't have well, retinal I know, surgery. But, but hey, it's all, I know it's uh, different. But hey, I, I had a positive attitude about it. <laughs> Still. I don't know what it was a negative, but you got anything you got to do, you got to have a positive attitude. And it's very interesting that in, in the story of the blind man who was given sight that uh, Jesus, we're told, he, he made a sort of mud. He didn't just command, you know, see, you know. He made a sort of mud and put it on their eyes. First of all, he regains his vision slowly and in degrees, not immediately. And then he's asked by someone, can you see those men? And to which he replies, yes, but they look like trees. And then if I remember the story correctly, Jesus makes some more of this mud like and then reapplies it and then his, gra his vision, but it's a very gradual process. It's not like Jesus walking on the water or, or Moses commanding the Red Sea to part. It, it implies that there's almost a method or a process. I'll tell you what it is, it's more shamanistic, calling on some sort of supernatural power, but working within the natural sphere, if that makes any sense. One evening, night came on me. Uh, really, I must have spent more time in the grocery store than I realized. I must have not taken accurate note of the time. And it became dark rather quickly on my way home. 
I kept walking. I had a pretty good sense that I was headed in the right direction. And I remember telling myself, well, you know, all you have to remember is just go past this street and then to this street and take a right and, you know, you'll be fine, etc. But it was then that it was really brought home to me just how much my vision had failed because as the darkness gathered, I had no idea where I was. And I kept walking and then I began to see cars with their headlights on. Sort of whisking by me. I know I was on the sidewalk, so I was out of the street. But it was very frightening since that's all I could see were, were headlights. And I walked and I walked and then I realized I had no idea where I was. I really had no idea what street I was on at that point. And a, a feeling of total helplessness, close to desperation, descended on me. And I thought, what am I going to do? I have absolutely no idea where I am or how, what direction to go in. I heard a, a girl's voice, a voice I recognized from the neighborhood, and I heard her say, oh, I know him, he gives me cigarettes. And someone came down to me. And then he sort of gently took me by the arm. He had very large, strong hands. And he said, now take me, grab my arm right here. And I, I grabbed his uh, arm, and he had this huge, bicep uh, and uh, he said I'll, I'll, I'll get you in my car and I'll take you home and I hesitated for a moment I just stopped and he kept walking forward I was holding his arm and he stopped it in the kindliest imaginable voice he said now you have to trust me he said I'm your eyes now and that made such an incredible that had such an impact on me. I thought, yes, I do have to trust you. I, that, that didn't dissuade me from continuing to try to go to the store by myself on foot. But then it happened a second time. And then I got that, that fearful feeling again that, oh my God, I'm, I'll never find my way back home. What am I going to do? And all of a sudden I heard a voice. That I, that I recognized, cry out, don't you still live here? And it was Eddie. And he told me to take his arm and he walked me a very short distance. And he said, okay, we're at your back door. And uh, Eddie told me unequivocally, Chuck, you cannot ever do this again or you will be killed. say hello to you. So at any rate, uh, give me a call if you get a chance. Call Mr. Eddie. He'd love to hear from you. So we'll be talking to you. Take care. Bye. Oh shit, he's out there. Did you hear that shit? Heart oh baby, why? Why did you say baby goodbye? Oh baby, why? He thinks he's gonna be some like fucking music no. star or something and you know. I, I hate to tell you, hey, there's a lot of people down on Broadway by guitars, they play trumpets down there, and you'll hear them, and they'll be down there singing. And you know what? A lot of people, they'll go by there, and they'll drop money right in the container. They'll say, well, dropping money, dropping money. Dropping. I guess he's got a new MC name. You know what he said? When he finishes, oh, baby, why? He's like, hey, you've reached Boy Rock. Oh, I guess man. not to be confused with Kid, Kid Rock. Rock. Yeah. Boy Rock. Uh, leave, you know, something. And I'm like, oh, for God's sake. That's why he's not going home. Boy rock. Boy rock my butt. Shit. He ain't there like Kid Rock. Mm-mm. I hope you do one day. Maybe you will. Maybe you will have a hit one day. Yeah, I'm not going to discourage you. Everybody, everybody, everybody does now. Everybody does. Everybody has a hit. I mean, if Justin Bieber could do it, why? But actually, Justin Bieber's got talent. Yeah. And perfect hair. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Well, now, now you, me, you look at the Osmonds. Mm -hmm. You look at them when they were kids, and all well, when they grew up, look at them, how they sang. Mm -hmm. And they had TV, they had a TV show on TV, and I mean, they went from star to a superstar. 
you got a lot of kids out there that come from nothing, but later life, you know, they, and, and I guess when you start singing, oh, sooner or later, you'll have a hit song, it's just going to take a little while. You but you it. know what? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Boy rock. <laughs> Boy rock. I hope we don't fall under the rock. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen, at his best, uh, writes poetry that's just exquisite. I mean, I think about his uh, song, Thunder Road. I've never heard a pop song with a better beginning. The screen door slams. Mary's dress wave, waves. Like a vision, she dances across the porch as the stereo plays. Roy Orbison singing for the lonely. Hey, that's me, and I want you lone only. I mean, that is just incredible poetry. Telephone calls are very important to me, uh, very important, um, because many days I'll sit in this apartment, you know, the entire day and not see a living, you know, soul. So uh, I, I do enjoy my telephone calls, that's for sure. Until uh, after the surgery. And so, uh, you know, I've just... I've just been, sort of been trying to fortify myself for the surgery, you know, drink, eating as much as uh, as possible and getting as much sleep as possible. And uh, that's been about it. That's just about been the whole story. I've called Megan like five times and left five different... Yeah, well, I've, I've left her five different voicemail messages including just one this uh, couple of days ago. Huh? Struggling? Hey, do they have personal problems? Well, not between the two of them, they don't. Well, they need to come sit down and see me. <laughs> they, between me and you and hey, hey, we'll work it. They're both just stressed over their job situations. You can't be stressed over a job. It, it, you got to go to work. you got to get up. you got to go to work. you got to come home. you got to pay bills on Friday. Put gas in your car, make sure you got plenty of oil in it. Make sure the tire's <laughs> good, make sure the car's running good. But a car is a job. You gotta keep it up and running. See. But see, hey, once you don't get stressed out of the job, just go to work and come home. Yep. Well, that's right. Like my wife, she said, How'd you, how's your day going? And I said, Day going, I reckon, I don't know. Uh, can I watch TV? I said, Yeah, I'm gonna watch some TV. Kids, y'all won't come in and watch the TV with Daddy. She said, you know, you pay more attention to them kids than you do me. I said, well, yeah. He's in pay by her. He's in pay. He can't do that without her. Of course, one aspect of, of a la recherche that I loved was uh, it's very frank. Uh, uh, examination of its gay characters and many of the characters in the novel prove eventually to be gay. He shows us that the gay characters may be the person you would least think is gay but the, it, his homosexuality is revealed very slowly and very gradually first hinted at and then fully revealed and uh, of what Proust wrote so elegantly about in A La Recherche, I had the joy of experiencing in real life on Lower Broadway in downtown Nashville. I didn't confine myself to a few gay bars or the few gay bars that I knew, but I also enjoyed going down to the uh, ostensibly straight bars on Lower Broadway that are so familiar to anyone who's familiar with the Nashville scene, the world famous Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, and Robert's Western Wear and others. I was particularly amazed at the soldiers from nearby Fort Campbell, Kentucky, who would come down on weekend passes and who would go to a bar like Robert's Western Wear and who would, uh, you know, uh, they would be in civilian clothing, jeans and sort of Western shirts. And then that when they were in the, uh, I guess the sanctity, and security of the bar 
would reach into their pockets and pull out drop earrings, put them in their ears, and then take to the dance floor together and dance with one another. It was uh, an incredibly homoerotic scene. I do recall one evening when I was uh, picked up, quite literally, by one of those young GIs uh, from Fort Campbell who uh, quite literally picked me up off my feet and gave me a huge open mouth kiss. And of course I was done for at that point. Quite an astounding <laughs> evening of sex. The young man who may appear to be the straightest may end up pulling out earrings and putting them in his ear and dancing with another man on the dance floor. Or he may pick you up off your feet and give you a huge open mouth kiss and tells you he wants to give you an orgasm in every conceivable way. <laughs> and we're so glad it's like that. My friend Jeff is coming in from LA. Uh, and so, you know, that will be very um, helpful as I go into this surgery, <laughs> which causes me some trepidation, believe me. Right here, right here, right here, right here, Chuck. There you go, buddy. Where'd that next I don't need to go up. That's Where's that? Long. I'm being tested. Somebody's. That's a long distance number, 1714. I don't need it. I know who she is. Yeah. Uh, some, someone trying to say something. Trying to say something? Yeah. What do you, what do you want to buy? Nothing. This is why I didn't answer it. Well, you, you can buy a man if you got, you buy a man if you got plenty of money. Well, that's why I ain't got a man then, because I ain't got plenty of money. <laughs> I guess how that goes out the door, don't it? Peace out. Where are you going? I'm gone. You gone, baby? You better bring some chicken breast back. I, I told you I'll bring you some thighs or some breasts. Hey, we all doing? They get your bad fix last night? <laughs> Chuck! Yes, sir. She's trying to kill me. Well, I heard all of that. Yeah, she, she wild in a bucket of woods. You seen deer run through the woods? And that, that's the way she would. She'd be like a brand new old city she are. But everything gonna go very well tomorrow. Well, I hope they so. They gonna say, Mr. Guy, you count back with five. You ain't gonna remember that. You ain't gonna remember what they said. You're gonna say, oh, huh? <laughs> they gonna slide that thing over your face real quick, and all you're gonna see is darkness. You, know I mean? you ain't gonna know what hit you. Well, good. Because as soon as, they, as soon as they wheel you up, take you out the elevator, they make a left turn right there, and they go in the second door. And when you hit that door, they say count back five. You don't even know what you don't remember what you even said. Cause I didn't. Cause that thing went right over my face. Now you know this is gonna be a Vanderbilt, Eddie. Yeah. It, it's a huge hospital. And since they built on, they got more emergency room areas, more operating rooms, and they can handle mass casualties over there. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> Fingers crossed and hope for the best, that's all we can do. When the surgeon says to you, I'm willing to try if you are, you know, <laughs> that pretty much says it, doesn't it? It's like saying, you know, I, I'm, you know, odds are against it, but you know, it's worth a shot, that kind of thing. And it is worth a shot, because it's the only shot I've got. And I've got them willing to pay for me to have $60,000 worth of surgery for free. Uh, it's funny how this retinal thing seems to be the biggest deal there is, you know, in eye surgery, besides maybe a cornea transplant, you know. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If I die on the operating table, I die. You know, that's just the way it is. I, I mean, you know, because nobody knows what's going to happen when you go into surgery. 
we ought to be about, what, 19th now or something? Exactly, we're just crossing 19th. And when we come to the clinic, there's a garage opposite the clinic on the left, uh -huh. and we'll want to take a left and enter that garage, and that's where we'll park. You ain't gonna remember that. You ain't gonna even what they said. You're gonna say, uh, uh, they're gonna slide that thing on your face real quick and all you're gonna see is dark. You ain't gonna know what he is. And it's hard to believe Tony Mangello's gone. Too soon. And he died from some just mi rather minor surgical problem that went awry. Chuck, you're gonna open your eyes, you're gonna walk outside and sit. Lord, I can see everything. Well, now, well let's not get carried away. Yeah, we, so uh, the job I most enjoyed was uh, managing the bookstore in downtown Nashville. Wonderful staff to work with of, uh, of people who truly uh, knew books, loved books, and enjoyed working with books and with book customers. I mean, when, when you, what do you do with an English degree? You either write or you uh, sell books uh, or you... Uh, uh, teach. I always had a problem every time I've been called faggot in my life, and I could, you know, retire to Mallorca right now. And, uh, you know, it never bothered me that much. I had my friend, somebody call a faggot in him, he'd say, yeah, let me show you what a faggot did do. You know, he'd say, you want my food up your ass? Uh, when I was in the fifth grade, I was John F. Kennedy's campaign manager in my fifth grade class. And, uh, and I'm happy to say he won the straw vote in my fifth grade class. So I must have had some powers of persuasion. But he was a country boy from Kentucky. Can I fuck he? <laughs> I'll never forget that. Can I fuck he? Yes, you can. I once told him, I said, Andy, you've got the biggest, most beautiful dick. He said, I've got my granddaddy's dick. <laughs> I said, well, I bet he wants it back. I'd leave you with some jewels, man. I tell you, Andy moved to Texas, damn it. <laughs> uh, I had to decide how to become a queer. Because we weren't gay then, we were queer. But then they pistol whipped me with a pistol. And as an older, much older friend of mine told me, Back in the 80s, I had a lot more fun when I was queer than I've ever had since I became gay. So I ended up spending the night in, in the hospital. He could have shot me with that gun much more easily than he could have beaten me with it. I'd never seen those guys before, never saw them again. They took my wallet with its $14 in it. <laughs> I can remember that number to this day. And uh, they got my house keys. Well, you know, I've always said I'm not a size queen, but at the end of the day... <laughs> Let's face it, uh, <coughs> it is the big ones that we tend to remember, isn't it? He wanted what they call separate maintenance or legal separation. And uh, my mother went ahead and filed for a full-scale divorce. And that blew, he blew his top over that. But my mother later uh, uh, intimated to me that she she always suspected that he was gay. My father, uh, when he moved out, he rented an apartment in what can only be described as a, a, a then uh, a gay enclave here in East Nashville. My happy adolescence. Oh. And then the day before I graduated high school, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. The bullet had entered Senator Kennedy's head from the rear and had traversed this and that and exited so and so and I was absolutely uncomprehending. It honestly felt as though I had been shot in the head myself. So it was a strange, to say the least, uh, senior year of high school. Uh, it had such wonderful high moments uh, including uh, having lunch in the cafeteria every day with a certain sophomore girl whom I met and immediately befriended 
and whose sparkling conversation and extraordinary wit and intelligence just dazzled me. Uh, her name was Oprah Winfrey, and uh, we would wait for one another every day in the lunchroom. This was a scene of our first production in Centennial Park, the first production of National Shakespeare, uh, as you like it. Uh, perfect sh show to be done, set in a park, as the uh, as the play itself is set in a forest, and uh, Centennial Park in Nashville is somewhat forested <laughs> with magnolia trees. I worked with the director. He asked me to work as his dramaturg, so I read the play every day. Uh, start to finish. We had a combined audience for the three or four performances that we did of, of about 2,000 people. Uh, got wonderful reviews and uh, Nashville Shakespeare Festival was uh, up and running and I'm very proud of that experience and of that being a small part, a small contributor uh, to the founding of that company. Well, it's done. It's over and done with. Well, that's not true. It's never over and done with because then's the convalescence, you know. The patient, you cannot drive a car, operate machinery, or power tools. So you have to put that off. Drink any alcoholic beverages, make any important decisions. Um, Bomb turkey! <laughs> Invade Egypt! No, not today. <laughs> oh, we went out on the porch. We were going to get something to eat, and I suddenly could see him, and I could see the shirt he had on. And I said, Jeff, you're, are you wearing a striped shirt? And he sort of like froze, and he was like, why, yes, I am. He said, you can see that? I said, yes, I can see it clearly. You know, I can see the houses now really well which is amazing to me. And, and Jeff said, Chuck, you're getting around with so much more assurance. It was about the fourth or fifth day after surgery that I started, you know, seeing major improvement. Can you see colors? Yes, yes I can. And then today I saw Cheryl for the first time. Hi, how are you Cheryl? All right, good, good. All right. Well, pretty good. What you up to? Yeah, same old thing, huh? And so with this little magnifying glass, I've been reading the labels on my prescription bottles. And, uh, I mean, I have to go looking for some light. You know, it's all, it's all a function of, of the light. Customers, oh, who pay as quickly as you help us keep electric rates low. Yeah, right. Sixty-nine fifty-one. Oh well. But he, uh, he was uh, talking about Lipstick Lounge, and he's like, he and his friend Emery were driving around, and there were all these girls going in Lipstick Lounge, and so Eddie stuck his head out the window and said, "Hey, baby, you want a man?" And he said, one of them turned and looked at him real harshly and said, "My, who are you calling baby?" Said, my baby's at home and made me mad and you know I said well you, Eddie you just can't contain yourself can you oh I say well I thought you maybe you had had an episode of low blood sugar Eddie okay well all right I'm just checking on you he said you're either gonna have to have it amputated or we or they may decide to do a knee replacement <laughs> you know and I'd say, well, somebody make up their fucking mind and first of all, tell me what's wrong with it. You know, is it arthritis or is it cancer? It's a huge difference. They are the height of professionalism and precision at General Hospital. I think, I think literally something a whole lot gets lost in translation. You know what I mean? I think that between what they tell him what he hears and repeats, it comes out, you know, very different. I think it's warm enough to raise the windows. Well, 
Or you'd have no idea what it means to literally sort of be out of the shadows. Yeah, John, her ex board thank you. They broke up and he got mad. He threw a brick old block to the front windshield and flattened off four of the cars right there. Who, who, who's off four of the cars? You remember John over here. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. I didn't think John had that in him. He made somebody mad. <laughs> I tell you, then John always seemed like the most mild mannered person. But I know that on a certain occasions they would fight like cats and dogs. But wow. So she dumped him. He stabbed all four of her tires and flattened them and then came back with a brico block and threw it through the through the car window. Busted the window out. Busted uh, stabbed all four tires. It's a good day in the neighborhood. It's a great day in the neighborhood, Chuck. Sunshine, blue skies, it don't get no better than this. 75, 8 degree weather, and it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. I love it. Right, Chuck? Yes, right, right. I love Andy. this weather, baby. Right. It don't get no right. better. Right. other writer I can think of who has that absolute mastery of language is Marcel Proust. I recall one, one metaphor in particular in which the young narrator of the novel uh, is a young boy and he's ill and his mother comes to his room to kiss him goodnight. She leans her head down and kisses him and Proust writes, it was as though her face were a ciborium, which carried within it all of the love in the world. A ciborium is the container, the golden container, uh, which is used by the priest at mass for the consecrated hosts, and which then the host is distributed to the faithful in Holy Communion. So that's a ciborium. And uh, the notion that this sacred vessel, which contains the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and then likening his mother's face to that, uh, which contained, in her case, all the love in the world. Marvelous image. I used to come like at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And I had to break myself from that. I remember finally telling myself one day, now cemeteries are for the dead, not for the living. I had to remind myself that I was still alive. And that spring and summer in Centennial Park did it for me. And reading all those great books. Feeling the sun beat down on me. Flirting with all the bandy boys. So I guess that was that summer of healing, as I call it. That was 09. As it rains in the city, so it rains in my heart. Verla. Well, I'm over this weather. And you know, my vision is, I wish it were better. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, we went out to dinner with uh, 
went out to lunch with uh, Jamie and Megan, and suddenly I realized I couldn't see a thing in that restaurant, and I couldn't even see Jamie and Megan sitting across the table from me. And I sort of went into a state of shock, so I'm sort of having that now every day. I think I allowed myself to get carried away there for a while. And I had a similar experience yesterday with Eddie when we were out walking, that um, even though it was so enjoyable, and it was, and I enjoyed it so much, I still realized I couldn't have made it had I not had hold of Eddie's arm. Because I just, I just simply don't see well enough to. And that was, that was, you know, sobering. It sort of is what it is. This is just probably as good as it'll get. And probably I'll be lucky if, it, if I can hold on to this, you know. So that's sort of been, a, like I said, a coming down to earth type thing for me after the initial exhilaration. But don't get me wrong, the operation was a great success. And the fact that I'm sitting here right now and I can see the refrigerator and the stove and the table and my prescription bottles. And, and, but it's so much better. I mean, I've gotten now, Jeff, to where I can go out and bring my own mail in, open it and read it with this little magnifying glass. And, and, uh, and, and you know, that, you know it's, it, things like that are huge in my life, you know. But I guess it's just human nature that, you know, you still, you, you know, you want more. It just didn't go well at all, um, and he wants me to have another operation on that left eye, and soon, too. And um, apparently, from his view, it's just not doing well. It's the fluid under the retina has gotten worse rather than better, and uh, now they want to do a third one. So he asked me, he said, how do you feel about having another? I said, well, I don't feel well about it at all. He said, well, I'm sure you don't. He said, but I, he said, uh, I, I just can't, you know, just stand by and let something really, really bad happen to the only eye that you've got vision in. I thought I was on some sort of like a course to stability, you know, and uh, uh, now it just seems like that's thrown that, shot that out of the water, you know. It's very discouraging to me. It just feels sort of like starting over again from scratch. You know, it's been such a drab, miserable week. I've really been in the pits, you know, and uh, not getting out or anything because it's just not fit to get out in. Can't see, can't see even in the apartment because it's so dark, you know. You can't much tell the difference between night and day. Uh, this new medicine the doctor gave me last week just has not agreed with me at all, and I stopped taking that shit last night. So then I, then I had water pouring in my kitchen window. That was the day it started raining, torrentially, and uh, Eddie has tried and tried to fix that window. And there was a knock at my front door, and I thought, well, who could that be? And uh, I, I said, who's there? And they said, Metro Police. And, and I looked out, and the yard was full of cops. This character, I mean, he must be something else. Cause, see, he escaped from jail. He's an escapee. This is a separate desperado from the one they got in the front apartment. So, I mean, you know, trashiest bunch of people I've ever had to live around in my life. So, I don't know, I've got to get the fuck out of here. That's all there is to it. I've got to get the fuck out of this place. Do what? I said he's pretty talented. Yes, he is. I'm lucky. That's very, very, very impressive, Jamie. I love it. And he found a new printer too, and he printed it on like this linen. Yeah, it's stock. got like a little linen. Uh huh. It's hard to feel, but you can see it sometimes in certain angles. Uh huh. But I everyone love it. there that will potentially get it is a big UT Vols fan. That was kind of the idea behind picking this image. Uh huh. Because you know they love, they're practically right. They in love Knoxville. Tennessee, in Knoxville. Yeah. yeah. So. Water. <laughs> I told Meg about that. Chuck was calling he it a princess. You were, you were in a mood that day. <laughs> I was. <laughs> it was called being a princess. Left and right. Little, you were a little bitchy that day. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. <laughs> I love it though. Seriously. I was a little bit on the rag that day. <laughs> and you were cussing like a sailor. Uh, that's what I was like. Was this drunk. is going to be a good lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's when we knew we had, he had a little too many. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are gone now. Mm -hmm. No more beer. 
The no beer more. days are over. At least I oh. I like pig crust. Yeah, I liked it too. That was so good. Probably we'll get a call tomorrow about how good that pizza was. <laughs> I will. I you know. know I will. I'll call you in Harriman tomorrow. You know I will. Thank you, Pat. Thank you again. Delicious. Yeah, delicious. Pizza. <laughs> All that was going on. I've been well, now, she and Jamie, I tell you, they just get along. That's all there is to it. They have fun together. She knows a good-looking man when she sees one, that's for sure. I was almost in Jerry Springer once. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Here we go. I was. Oh, God. Luckily, that got canceled at the last minute. It's like, you're going to be the guy who you have this relationship, then you find out she's been cheating on you, and you got to be heartbroken and all this. Give us and your we'll, heartbroken face. I don't know. I, I, my heartbroken face? Yeah. That looks like you're, you have to poop. <laughs>Denomination of the bill. Twenty. And this is the color identifier. Brown. If you're like going from room to room, you're about to walk into a wall or something. You see, you know there's something there. There's no light. But as you're going toward the window. gonna send me a man uh, to give me walking lessons and with um, uh, he'll bring me a long white cane and uh, will teach me how to use that to get around without walking so we had a great time and then the orchestra just oh. They just are magnificent. And this young violinist, Augustin uh, Hadlick, oh, was he ever exquisite. Looked exquisite, too. He's a graduate of Juilliard. It was just beyond magnificent, I'm telling you. And we were on the fifth row. In the center, I could see the conductor and the soloist so well. Well, I think my vision is, I mean, I, I knock wood and I don't want to jinx anything, but I think it's getting better. Oh, well, you're so incredibly sweet and thoughtful, Margaret. Thank you so much. That is the most incredibly sweet thing I've ever heard in my life. But all I, I've not bought in one of your custom-made, you know, wood frames, anything heavy or anything. Just something just extremely simple. And Topeka is not Manhattan. But, uh, now I've heard wonderful things about Lawrence. Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I like the way you said that. Your typically understated, nice person way. I'm sure it's not that exciting. <laughs> Most people would say Kansas is death. It's death warmed over, you know, it's, you know, it's worse than purgatory, but no, I'm sure it's not that bad.
ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. So Drew's making a movie. We're doing Cinema Verite over here. Uh, uh, Jamie? See, he thinks I'm going to kick the bucket Tuesday and he wants to have some kind of like, you know, uh, uh, photographic record. I don't want to make this a poor, pitiful me because, shit, I'm well aware there are people out there with lung cancer, brain cancer. You know what I'm saying? This actually takes a lot out of me, Drew. I hope you appreciate that. He's, he's making a film, Lawrence. Uh, believe it or not, about me. If you can imagine such a thing. It is indeed a porn movie. Lawrence, now, listen, sort of try to control yourself, but I'm naked right now while we're speaking, okay? It's a little documentary that Drew's making called Sex for One, and uh, so I'm, you know, doing my part. I'm a trooper, you know?